Tonight, desperation in a disaster zone. The urgent need for more help in Pakistan. Catastrophic flooding, a surge in disease and hunger. Now the pleas for aid on the ground. People here will tell you they've received little, if any, aid. The iconic Canadian brands pulling sponsorship from Hockey Canada as the calls for resignations get louder. They've doubled down and it's disgusting, really. It boggles the mind. And why paying with plastic could soon cost you more. People get their credit cards, they get their points, but they rarely ask themselves, who's paying for that? Are all those free perks really free anymore? This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. Tonight, doctors in flood-ravaged Pakistan are struggling to save lives and contain outbreaks of disease. The UN is now calling for five times as much humanitarian aid, more than $800 million. There's an urgent need on the ground that our team witnessed firsthand. The floods were already a record-breaking disaster for Pakistan. 7.9 million people displaced, nearly 1,700 directly killed by floodwaters, and about 350 more dying from outbreaks of disease. What the UN fears could be the beginning of a second wave of death and destruction. Margaret Evans traveled to the worst hit areas of the country where the water levels are still high and the danger is still rising. Old fashioned human toil. Long a constant in this country, now made heavier by the legacy of climate change. These laborers are tasked with mending a stretch of railway track knocked out by floodwaters over the summer. Back-breaking work, but critical. Hadi Bucks Jamali has worked for the railway for 30 years. In Sindh, we are destroyed, he says. Our livestock, our trains, our roads, everything. People are living on the road. Mosquitoes are biting them. We need help. We need help. An estimated 75% of districts in Sindh province remain flooded, including key roads and bridges. This one was originally built to link two towns on either side of a deep drainage canal. Bridge and canal now both submerged. Engineer Zafarullah Sumro is monitoring the water level. How much time it takes to drain out the water? I think uh, in this situation, 15 to 20 days are more than this bridge will be normal. The longer the water lingers, the greater the risk of hunger and disease for hundreds of thousands of people made homeless. All across Sindh, tattered tents clinging to narrow strips of high ground stretch as far as the eye can see. So too do the haunted looks on parents' faces, afraid they won't be able to feed their children. We lost everything, says this mother. Our walls came down. We only managed to save ourselves. Many people living in Pakistan already live in the most dire of circumstances. This is what it looks like when you add a climate catastrophe on top of it. People here will tell you they've received little, if any, aid. And critics say the government isn't ready for another one and that the world certainly isn't either. Another camp, this one close to the city of Badin and within arm's reach of a Pakistan military base. Soldiers distributing food and medicines. The government in Islamabad says it is now out of money. And there are growing demands here for what activists call climate justice from the West. But the international response, we are not very happy with that. Because we feel that uh, this is because of climate change. And Pakistan is not a great contributor to climate change. Less than 1%, in fact. As the test trains begin to roll, the railway workers say they know there may well be more and worse flooding on the horizon. If there is, they say, they'll simply fix the tracks again. Part of the price they're already paying. So, Margaret, as you mentioned, this isn't just a case of rebuilding, which is going to take years, but also there's the immediate health crisis, which the UN says puts millions of people at risk. That's right, Ian, and it's not just the drugs, you know, the malaria pills, the clean drinking water. It's also 
access people have to medical care. We brought you the story last week of a mother who had to walk through floodwaters to give birth. She gave birth by C-section. The child was born in difficulty and just hours old, she had to send him with an uncle to another city for specialty care. Uh, when we reported the story, uh, the baby was still in stable condition. We've unfortunately learned that he's since died. He died a few days later. It's a pretty stark reminder of just how dangerous, how fragile things are for people in Pakistan in those flood zones right now. Ian. All right, Margaret, thank you. The Canadian government now says it will match more donations to Pakistan flood relief. It will now be matching contributions to the Humanitarian Coalition. That's an umbrella organization providing help to up to $7.5 million. The cap has been raised multiple times in response to the generosity of Canadians. It was originally at $3 million. A major development tonight in the Hockey Canada controversy. One of the country's best-known companies, Tim Hortons, says it's pulling its sponsorship for the men's program this season, and it's not the only one. As Ashley Burke shows us, the calls for Hockey Canada leadership to resign are getting louder. It's a brand that's built itself around Canada's winter sport. Bring Team Canada home. And for years has sponsored Hockey Canada. Is brought to you in part by Tim Hortons, the official copy of Team Canada. But Tim Hortons says it's now sitting the entire season out, cutting this year's sponsorship of men's hockey, including the World Juniors. Scotia Bank announced it's doing the same. We're witnessing an organization that seems to be more interested in protecting themselves and their jobs than protecting the public, the women. Uh, and the players. It's a huge financial blow amid growing calls for Hockey Canada's leadership to resign over its practice of settling some allegations of sexual abuse using a controversial fund and over a culture that's seen police investigate multiple allegations of group sexual assault. Hockey Canada's tone deafness to the fact that they have lost the confidence of Canadians uh, needs to end, which is why we stopped funding them, which is why we're calling for change. It's clear right now that the leadership doesn't get it. This after defiant testimony from Hockey Canada. Our board, frankly, does not share the view that senior leadership should be replaced on the basis of what we consider to be substantial misinformation and, and unduly cynical attacks. But that defense fell flat with the two largest provincial hockey federations. Hockey Quebec says it's lost confidence and will not hand over player registration fees. The Ontario Hockey Federation says it wants to do the same. We could see others follow. And to me, I think at the end of the day, we have to make decisions in the best interest of those kids that want to play the game. Because let's face it, the game is hurting. But it's sponsorship sometimes in the millions that could really hurt. They have millions of dollars. They can weather the storm for years. And this has to happen, that the sponsors stand up to Hockey Canada. That is the only way this gets rectified. Ashley, we've heard from Hockey Canada tonight. Ian, in a statement, Hockey Canada says it's talking to its sponsors about its plan and is taking steps to foster a safe environment on and off the ice. But Hockey Canada gets more than a quarter of its funding from sponsors, and Tim Hortons tonight said it is deeply disappointed by the lack of progress so far. It still intends to fund women's, youth and para hockey, just not the men's team this season. Ian? Ashley, thank you. Canadians who prefer to pay with certain credit cards may be in for a shock tomorrow. A new surcharge. Anis Haidari now with why businesses can pass along some card fees to you. The cost to run a coffee shop is high these days. You know, small restaurants like our own that are labors of love are uh, truly holding on by their fingernails. That grip could get a bit stronger because of new rules for credit cards in Canada. Businesses can now charge people using Visa or MasterCard about 2% extra on top of their bill. We're really at, in, at a point of razor-thin margins, and 2% could matter, you know. Uh, it could make a difference. Businesses have had to pay transaction fees every time you pay with a credit card, but a class-action lawsuit has finally been settled. And now, retailers like Chris Rampin can pass the cost on to consumers. I don't see another solution, frankly. I would say 99% of our transactions are all on 
card one way or the other. There are perks to using credit. It's just convenient, I mean, to use, use the plastic card rather than carrying the cash. I get really good points with my credit card um, that may help me travel. Like, no, no, points over everything. People get their credit cards, they get their points, they get their rebates, they get their benefits, but they rarely ask themselves, who's paying for that? The credit cards with more generous rewards often had hefty transaction fees that retailers covered, but now they can pass those fees directly onto the customer. Only those consumers who choose to pay using uh, their credit cards, and in some cases the more expensive uh, credit cards, are going to be the ones that are going to be asked to pay a portion of those costs. That could be a tough sell. The cost of living is already fairly high, especially with cost of food and eating out. So with that extra 2%, I'm more inclined to use my debit card. While these changes don't apply to every credit card out there, retailers must make it clear when they plan to charge them. What isn't clear is whether they're going to do so at all. Anis Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. Now to the costly cleanup underway in Atlantic Canada after Fiona. Tonight, the hardest hit parts of Nova Scotia are under a new state of emergency. This move allows military members to provide greater help in the recovery. The province is also asking for more military personnel on the ground. One MLA says hundreds of constituents have called her about their lack of power and in many cases running water. Twelve days after Fiona, more than 5,000 customers are still without power in Nova Scotia. In PEI, it's more than 8,000. And in Florida tonight, the painful recovery continues after Hurricane Ian. The reported death toll now well over 100. As Magda Gebersalasa shows us, U.S. President Joe Biden got a first-hand look at the damage today, and so did residents from one of the hardest-hit areas. Debris-lined streets, destroyed homes, and heartbroken people in Fort Myers, Florida, a week after Hurricane Ian. This is everything we've all worked our whole life for. Absolutely. And it's gone. Among the hardest hit, Sanibel Island. Homes are torn to bits, cars buried in downed trees, and streets are littered with debris. The community is still cut off from the mainland after part of the causeway was washed away. Residents now allowed to come back by boat to see what is left. These homeowners were lucky. We thought we would come back and find everything gone. And I mean, we just have to fix up our yard. Others, meanwhile, are in need of the basics. More than 34 million bottles of water have been handed out. Power is still out for some 250,000 customers. And the search for victims continues as crews clear roadways and sift through destroyed structures. Today, President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden flew in to see the damage for themselves and offer more help. We have one job, and only one job, and that's to make sure the people of Florida get everything that they need to fully, thoroughly recover. Federal funding has been extended to 60 days to fully cover the state as it cleans up and provides supplies to those in need. Putting politics aside, Florida's governor, a Republican, was grateful for the help. You have some of these communities here, their, their bill for debris removal will likely be more than their annual budgets. He says there is still a lot more work to do. But I'll tell you, the spirit of the people of this state in southwest Florida has been phenomenal. The hope is that spirit will carry them through a recovery that could take years. Mark de Gebrasalasa, CBC News, Washington. In British Columbia, it's a different sort of extreme weather that's produced a troubling scene. You're looking at a huge number of dead salmon stranded on a creek bed, nearly dry from weeks of record drought. This time of year is when the salmon start to head up those creeks to spawn. Renee Filipponi shows us why this could be a long-term disaster. Weeks and weeks with no rain, and this creek in Port Moody is pretty much dry. Okay, normally we'll be in, sitting in water up to boat here. And that's, like you can see, <laughs> that's it. That's it right That's there. it. There. I mean, it's like a garden hose running down the creek right now. It's something Dave Benny has never seen. For nearly 30 years, he's volunteered at the hatchery here and says this time of year, it should be teeming with salmon ready to spawn. We'd have chum salmon and coho 
and you see them in here. They, they hold in here sometimes in this pool here and all up through here. It's devastation on Heltzik First Nation territory near Bella Bella. Low water levels and a sea of dead salmon. Uh, traditionally been one of our largest uh, pink and chum producers uh, for, for decades and decades. And so it's uh, heartbreaking to see that uh, it's happening there now. The concern is this scene may be playing out across the region. It's pretty hard to say how many salmon actually um, died up in there, but I would guess there's probably hundreds of thousands if you total them all together. Um, all of those salmon that are just kind of wasted away had, didn't even have the opportunity to reproduce. Scientists say the impact will be felt for years because these fish won't spawn. It's just been a death by a thousand cuts, it seems, for many of these populations that are, in some cases, just holding on. Uh, and then you have uh, the drought that we're experiencing. It's just, it's just a race against climate change right now. This is where we'd have fish. We would be coming up. Well, they just jumped. There's fish jumping all over out there right now. Meanwhile, salmon wait in Burrard Inlet. It's impossible to make it upstream. Look out there at high tide and you see fish flopping and realize they might not ever make it back to spawn. Dry weather with no end in sight, spelling a possible early end to their life cycle. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Port Moody, B.C. Tomorrow, Alberta's United Conservative Party will choose a new leader and that province's next premier to take over from Jason Kenney. I will be finishing my time in public service with a heart full of gratitude uh, and with no fundamental regrets. Kenney resigned as premier and party leader in May after narrowly surviving a leadership review. The race for premier includes Daniel Smith and Brian Jean, two former leaders of the now defunct Wild Rose Party. Four members of Kenney's cabinet are also in the running. Tonight, one of Canada's biggest grocery store chains is using new technology to move goods, self-driving delivery trucks. As Nisha Patel explains, it may be a glimpse of what's to come. You're not seeing things. This delivery truck is driving without a human behind the wheel. Loblaw has five self-driving trucks hitting the roads in and around Toronto, but they won't be coming to your front door. They'll only be used between the warehouse and some stores. It's a bit more manageable because you're going on a fixed route between locations that you know. The pilot project started back in 2020 with someone in the driver's seat for safety. Since then, they say there have been no accidents. We have multiple different sensors on the truck, so uh, multiple lidars, multiple cameras, multiple radars as well. Regulators gave the green light. Now the safety driver has moved to the passenger seat and could be removed entirely in the coming months. Gaddick, the U.S. startup developing the technology, predicts driverless trucks will be 30% cheaper than regular ones. To address the driver shortage and meet the demands of the end consumer, this kind of technology, this kind of solution is very critical. There are 30,000 open jobs for truck drivers in Canada right now. A spokesperson for the Canadian Trucking Alliance tells CBC News they don't see this technology taking away jobs, just changing them. We should be able to use this technology in those cases that we are definitely short in uh, human uh, activity and manpower. Experts say while going driverless works for some parts of the supply chain, like highway transportation, neighborhood streets aren't ready. It should be a long, long time. I don't think that uh, you have any breakthrough on somehow replicating human brain and uh, the way that we think and do judgment. I don't think that we are there. Still, these driverless deliveries mean the technology is accelerating. And for those on the road, seeing that empty driver's seat may take some getting used to. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Many Canadians have been looking to side hustles for extra income. Now some are turning it into their full-time gig. Do you want to you know, work 10 hours for somebody else, or do you want to work 10 hours for yourself? But some experts say it may not be a smart move. And the New York Times' Maggie Haberman reveals what she learned sitting down with Donald Trump. I was surprised and said, oh, you were able to take those with you? But first, Blue Jays' fever heats up ahead of the playoffs. Maybe the boys will take it all the way this year. We're back in two. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has this morning decided to award the 2022 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. While well, the prestigious prize went to 
U.S. scientist Carolyn Bertozzi, K. Barry Sharpless, and Danish scientist Morten Meldahl. It was for their work on so-called click chemistry, a way of building and combining molecules, essentially like Lego pieces, to develop medicines, map DNA, and create new materials. Anticipation is at a fever pitch for meaningful October baseball in Toronto. The Blue Jays will host the Seattle Mariners this weekend. They'll be the first postseason games held here in six years. Thomas Dagala shows us what it means for the team and the city. With a fresh shipment of t-shirts for October baseball, Tex Thomas is already dreaming of a deep postseason run. I'm excited. I'm going to be at the game on Friday night cheering uh, our boys on. After the pandemic forced the Blue Jays out of the country, playing on the road in empty stadiums and a minor league ballpark, reaching the postseason now feels extra special. Of course we're rocked. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so we, we're pumped, right? Bring the good vibes, you know, maybe the boys will take it all the way this year. Stars Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Bo Bichette never hit at home in October until now. And then there's ace pitcher Alec Manoa. Pearl strike three, he got it. Who's got more than two dozen family members and friends traveling to Toronto to cheer him on. We were all texting each other, going, we've got it, we're going to win. And even my mom, who's 76 years old, texted me at 2.30, Toronto! <laughs> For the wild card round starting Friday, the Blue Jays face Seattle. Now, Toronto has only beaten the Mariners twice in seven matchups this season, but the Jays will have one big advantage for this whole series. That same raucous crowd who six years ago roared for Edwin Encarnacion's walk-off home run. We think that's a big advantage for us, especially after the last couple of years of not being here. So how far can they go? The Jays are being given a 5.8% chance of winning the World Series. But consider the 2019 Washington Nationals and last year's Atlanta Braves, both champions who were only given marginally better odds. There's a reason why they say that just get in and you have a chance to win it. This team certainly has the talent for a deep postseason run. Good afternoon, Pro League Sports. Summer's game may yet become Canada's fall obsession. It's this one here. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Actor Alec Baldwin and the producers of the film Rust have settled a lawsuit with the family of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. She was shot dead during filming last year. Baldwin was holding the prop gun when it went off, but he says he didn't pull the trigger. That is the subject of a criminal investigation. Hutchins' widower will now be the executive producer of the film, and production resumes in January. The reporter who won a Pulitzer Prize for covering Donald Trump was often the target of his hatred. I don't speak to her. She's fake. And the New York Times is a very dishonest newspaper. But despite that, he still sat down with her three times. He is more focused than anyone I have ever covered in politics or outside of politics on getting attention. Maggie Haberman opens up about her conversations with Donald Trump after the White House next. Please welcome Maggie Haberman. It seems like Maggie Haberman is having a moment. Do you think he's aware of the contradictions that exist when he speaks? No. Okay. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> the Pulitzer Prize winning White House correspondent okay. for the New York Times has been trending all week on talk shows and online. And this is why Haberman's new book, Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America, it is a detailed profile of the former president from the one journalist who spent more time covering Trump than anyone else, more than two decades. And Maggie Haberman joins us now from New York City. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. We have all seen Trump from afar, but you sat down with him three times since he left, left office. And, and I'm curious, what's he like in person? Trump can be, and I explore this, uh, very charming. He can be very funny. He can be entertaining. He can be, you know, all of the things that he doesn't come off on his social media posts. Uh, <laughs> 
that it, that is when he is in salesman mode and he is he is trying to sell himself or charm whoever he's in front of. Uh, we had these three conversations. The first one, he was in salesman mode. As I said, he was very aware of the damage that the January 6, 2021 riot at the Capitol had done to his legacy. And, you know, I, he, I don't think this part he cared about, but the damage it, it did to the underpinnings of democracy in the country. He wanted to talk about his record. He wanted to present himself as if none of that had ever happened. I saw him a few weeks later. He seemed to be going backwards in terms of his acceptance of uh, where things were and where he was politically. And then finally in September, he was voluble. He would not stop talking. And, you know, the, the conversation can, you know, meander and it can be hard to redirect. But he is often in person very different than how he comes off uh, on social media. Speaking of social media, he has constantly attacked you and the New York Times. So Maggie Haberman gets a Pulitzer Prize. She's a third-rate reporter, New York Times. But she was wrong in Russia. So was everyone else. They should all give back their Pulitzer Prizes. I don't speak to her. She's fake. And the New York Times is a very dishonest newspaper. So why would he sit down for three interviews with you? Because he's obsessed with the New York Times, and that really is what it's about. The New York Times is an avatar to him <laughs> over many decades uh, of the elites in New York City who he felt like didn't accept him, and he wants to see if, as one of his aides once said to me, see if he can get a good story. And that really is what it's about. He's also, and I, I can't stress this enough, he is more focused than anyone I have ever covered in politics or outside of politics on getting attention uh, and getting media coverage. And, you know, he doesn't actually really subscribe, I think, to the idea that all press is good press because he does get very upset by some of the coverage. But in general, he considers negative attention to be productive, too. And let's talk more about the psychology of Trump. You've studied him for a long time. You've thought about him for a long time. And, and you kind of whittle down his behavior to a handful of, of, of moves. Tell us about that. Sure. So with Trump, there are these recurring patterns and recurring behaviors, and there's not very many of them. There's the quick lie. There is a, a, a diversion of blame. There is an attempt to deflect. And, and the issue is always just figuring out which move he's using. I mean, one of the things that those of us who covered him in the White House got asked, all of us, over and over again is, why is he doing X, Y, Z? Why did he do that? And, and sometimes it's not always apparent why he's doing something because he's much more calculating than people realize. Does he actually believe he won the last election? It's a really good question, and I get asked that a lot. It was certainly uh, clear in his behavior right after the November 2020 election that he appeared cognizant that he had not won, but that shifted pretty quickly. And now it's just very hard to tell whether this is something he's saying or whether he has convinced himself of it. But uh, he, he, he says it so frequently that uh, I'm not sure there's a significant difference. Did Donald Trump tell you that he took classified documents to Mar-a-Lago? You, you, you write about a strange or cryptic exchange with Trump about his letters from the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. I asked him in our September interview on a lark, did he take any memento documents? Because he was so proud of these letters from Kim Jong-un and he would wave them around. Uh, and we saw that over and over again. You know, he would show them to reporters, he would show them to visiting dignitaries. Uh, so I asked him about this and his response was that no, he didn't. He said, nothing of great urgency, no. Then he seemed to volunteer something about the Kim Jong-un correspondence. And he said, so I don't have it in front of me, but it was something to the effect of we have, you know, we have the Kim Jong-un letters. And I was surprised and said, oh, you were able to take those with you? <laughs> and he just kept talking. And I said, wow. And he, or ha, huh, something. <laughs> and he registered my surprise and then backtracked and said, no, I think those are in the archives. And in fact, they weren't. But it was just impossible to know what to make of any of what he was saying in that moment. It's much more revealing in hindsight after the August 8th search by the FBI of Mar-a-Lago. You know, there has been criticism, especially on Twitter, uh, by people who, who have accused you of withholding crucial reporting about Trump from the public in order to, to sell the book. What do you say to that? Books take time. Books are a different process. I wanted to paint a fuller portrait of Trump. I turned my attention to this book in earnest after his second impeachment trial, which ended in, I believe, February of 2021. Uh, you know, and it's a, a constant process of going back, getting more information from sources, finding uh, new things out. Uh, you know, it, if, if I have information that is confirmed and reportable, my goal is always to put it into print.
Maybe this is true of all New York Times reporters, but you are relentless in your approach to the job. I mean, just counting up the number of stories that you filed uh, on Trump uh, for the Times, uh, 599 stories uh, in 2016 alone. It's staggering, um, but it, it's taken a bit of a toll. Okay, my son will not stop FaceTiming me, so. I gotta call you guys back, I gotta call you back. What's wrong, honey? You, you need to, you guys, you need to spare me. Bye-bye. What's, what's going on? So I'm coming home on an on 8 o'clock train That's in the morning. That's sad. Oh, honey. I love you so much. You say your biggest mistake was, was promising your kids that they would get their mom back at the end of the last campaign. That didn't happen. How, how do you weigh the personal sacrifice with the importance of, of the story you've been covering? This is my job. This is, you know, this is what we do as journalists. Uh, you know, I think what we do is vitally important. I, I do think it's important to put it in perspective. There are people who are, you know, uh, serving in wars. There are people who are, are you know, I I engaging in, in medical help with, with for people who have diseases. I, I'm not suggesting that uh, I'm curing cancer, but I do think <laughs> what we do is incredibly important. Uh, you know, and, and I do my job with intensity, and my kids know that, and I try to make up for it by being more present now than than I was at various points over the uh, the Trump White House, and 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 hope that that uh, hope that that heals some. One last thing, based on everything you know, and particularly the time you spent with him getting ready for this book, is he going to run in 2024? I think he's backed himself into a corner where he has to. I think that the fact that I think he would like the uh, presidential protections that the White House affords people as uh, shields from investigation. He also loses relevance. He also loses money if he's not running. So I, I think he will. Now, his heart doesn't seem to be in it the way it once was. We'll see if that changes, uh, assuming he becomes a candidate. Uh, but I still think he's much more likely than not to declare a campaign. Maggie Haberman, really nice speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you. So this book, Getting a Lot of Attention, comes out in an America that's as deeply divided as it's ever been. But as you can imagine, and you could hear in that interview, she is unflinching in her sense of duty in terms of uh, reporting the big story. After the break, leaving behind the corporate world to start a business. No, it sounds great. Obviously, I'm going to turn my passion into profits. But what are some of the cautions for people, do you think? The answer, after the break. Canada is in the midst of a massive labor shortage, lots of work, but too few workers. And the impacts are everywhere, from product shortages to long waits at the doctor's office. No one seems to have a solution. Last night, Adrian sat down with employers and employees to discuss how things got so bad. We as a workforce feel disrespected, and I think that my generation, and maybe I'm wrong, my generation is not willing to be... Um, considered for, you know, we're not willing to settle, we're not willing to be considered for less than what we bring to the table. As an employer though, sometimes your hands are tied. You know, we bring up COVID. We didn't know. We all, you know, I thought, okay, let's go home for two weeks. When we come back, everything will be good and back to normal. And the construction industry didn't stop. After that conversation, we asked for your stories, your struggles, and your solutions to the labor crunch. And there was one consistent theme. It's time for a major rethink. Here are some of your comments. I could understand everyone's point of view. We're in a real tailspin. Working in the education field, I see it every day, the lack of staff. I think it's time we rewarded the working poor. I currently work in a hair salon, have a second job in theater. There are many issues with how much work is required and what's offered in return. And one more. I think we need employers to be innovative, even if it means breaking up several jobs to compromise and make the workplace more flexible. There are lots of Canadians already chasing that flexibility with a side hustle for a little extra money. A growing number are trying to make those part-time gigs full-time so they can quit their regular jobs. But as Ellen Morrow shows us, that has a knock-on effect for employers. Chelsea Frater is taking her future into her hands literally. Cleaning, catering and doing photography. Once three side hustles, now her full-time work after quitting her nine to five during the pandemic. So I had to make a choice on what I wanted to do. Do you want to, you know, work 10 hours for somebody else or do you want to work 10 hours for yourself? Um, but then you're also scared because it's like, 
am I going to make the same kind of money? Am I going to lose stability? Am I going to lose um, my comfort? Contrast for me how you're feeling now versus how you were feeling in your last weeks at your job. Night and day, the fact that I can do what I need to do, make the money times two, times three of what I was making before and not feel like I'm pressured to do it and I'm happy to do it, that to me, I like, I will never go back to work. And if we want to bring our side hustle to the next level, we need to get some steam. So-called so side hustles are happening. now becoming so much more to so many. So you might start with this really big idea. Shunning traditional work, these students are learning how to turn them into their main source of income. Oh, money. OK, I like that. This is a small workshop, but so many people want to figure out how to turn a side hustle into their main source of income that this college is offering weekend courses for the first time ever to meet the demand. And enrollment in the small business program is the highest it's ever been since it started more than a decade ago. Carrie Ellen Walser is the coordinator of Durham College's small business program. I think a lot of people are wanting to invest in themselves and invest in their passions and um, we're seeing a lot of technology that helps us to make those businesses more accessible. So besides technology making this easier, what other factors are driving this? Well, a lot of people have had more time for their, for their hobbies and have developed new hobbies and sometimes maybe those were developed out of trying to deal with some of the anxiety or the loneliness or some of the you know, discomfort that has come from the pandemic. So research has shown that as many as three out of five Canadians are looking for some kind of side hustle and some of those people will turn it into a full time job and that's making it hard for employers. We're off to meet one business that's struggling to find workers. Wow. This warehouse usually is uh, full of fitness equipment to the to the roof. Um, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't find uh, enough labor or the labor shortage that we have. Uh, to manage the warehouse. Uh, Nasser Obeid uh, is president of Matrix Fitness, an exercise equipment company. How do you feel when you see it like this? It was, it was motivating uh, for the staff when they see their equipment here waiting to go out to customer sites. Um, now that there's only a few left, they, they're worried. Not only is it hard to attract uh, employees, to Obeid says it can be hard to keep the uh, ones he already uh, has. This person uh, enjoyed cooking and making cookies and um, has made that into a business. Yeah, now she shell, sells through social media, so she no longer wants to you know, work in an office or, or work remotely even for anybody. So this staffing crunch, how much of a challenge has it been for your business? We think we're offering the right packages. We're flexible with our working hours. We have benefits. Um, so we just don't know. Where have they all gone? Where, where are they? Ben Lafort is an economist and as a side hustle, he writes a finance blog with tips on how to get ahead. Good bro. His most important job is dad to his young son. It's a tricky balance, high risk for burnout, but the extra income he says gives his family extra security for the future. Can you take this one too? If you have one job at nine to five, it's literally the definition of all your eggs in, in one basket. You know, it sounds great. Obviously, yeah. I'm going to turn my passion into profits. But what are some of the cautions for people, do you think? You should try it as long as you can to keep the side and side hustle and try to do both. Because uh, not only does it diversify your human capital, but also makes it easier to save money and, and get ahead, right? Oh, that's beautiful. Can you look at me? Remember Chelsea Freighter? She hopes to eventually open her own photography studio. A dream only made possible, Chelsea says, by her jump away from the office. Do you miss anything about the corporate work world? <laughs> Definitely not. I don't miss a thing. Um, maybe the benefits, but I can afford my benefits out of pocket. So it's not easy for sure. Um, but you have to have consistency and determination to really make it work for you. Can you get a smile? <laughs> That's utter up. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Retirement is another factor in Canada's labour shortage, something roughly 600,000 Canadians did last year alone. 
We'll look at how that is forcing some companies to get creative. Coming up soon on The National. After the break, she was the first face of Marketplace, blazing a trail for women in television. I'm Joan Watson. Welcome to Marketplace. Joan reflects on the show's beginning 50 years later. And you've heard of pumpkin spice. What about a pumpkin house? We'll take you there in our moment. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, how the current protests against Masa Amini's death are building off decades of women's activism in Iran, and why, for some people, things feel different this time. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It is one of the longest running television programs ever. CBC News Marketplace is celebrating 50 years. The consumer investigative show has evolved a lot over the decades, but it is built on the foundation created by the show's original host. One of the current hosts, David Common, went to meet her. Okay, ready to fly. In three, two, one. Fly them. All set for a brand new season. I'm very excited about it. So am I. Harry Brown is my new co-host. I'm Joan Watson. Welcome to Marketplace. What a way to kick off a TV show. Tonight on Marketplace. 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 Marketplace began in 1972, a consumer investigative show that would endure. And with a woman as host of a network TV program back then, Joan Watson was a trailblazer. That is the converted Simca with the modified safety features on it. It will be pulled on a cable from an engine way up the other end of the track, come down here and go on impact up there to the barrier and hit it. Five decades on, we're in Halifax to find the Marketplace original. Hello, David. Very good to meet you. It's my pleasure. Joan is now 90 and sharp as they get. I'm one of the current hosts. Well, it's welcome to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> it wasn't official until you're welcome. And Joan remembers what motivated their work. The inequity of some situations that young families found themselves in, things they couldn't afford, places they couldn't go, kids they couldn't educate. And usually we could do something. That was the great part about it. We made change. Joan would go on to shape the program and stay as host for a decade. We actually have something for you. We have a check. Driven by a desire to be an advocate for the average person. But you're not going to talk I'm, about them? Not today, I'm not. Because you've missed a good chance, Mr. Lawrence. You'll be back, I know. You're right. <laughs> you broke a barrier in many ways by being not just the first host of Marketplace, but a woman who was a host at a time not many women were hosts of TV programs. That was quite true, and I got a kick out of it. <laughs> it was lots of fun. What was it that most excited you about being on the program? When change started to happen as a consequence of Marketplace, that's when my flag went up and I got a big kick out of it. Tell me, what do you think of luncheon meats now? I was really surprised to find out that how uh, bad uh, these luncheon meats are that we find out that you can buy on the supermarket. Marketplace has evolved in the years since. I haven't been diving in a few years. I'm told this is what it's going to take to get a job. What is it that they're doing? They're sexualizing women. Taking on a wider array of investigations. We're launching a new special series about Canadians from coast to coast calling out discrimination. Good evening, I'm Joan Watson. But it's built on the foundation Joan laid out 50 years on. This is Marketplace. David Common, CBC News, Halifax. And you can catch the special 50th anniversary season premiere of Marketplace this Friday, 8 p.m. on CBC Gem and CBC Television, 8.30 in Newfoundland. Well, forget the pumpkin patch. One farmer's luring customers with a custom-made pumpkin house. Pumpkins are, of course, the official gourd of October. I just made that up. So when we stumbled on this quirky New Brunswick attraction, there was really no other possible moment. So I'm sitting in our pumpkin house. We figure there's somewhere around five to six hundred, uh, various sizes. My son Glenn, he's the crop manager, and uh, he approached me. I'd like to build a pumpkin house, so he bought some steel, and after about 40 hours of labor, we have a pumpkin house. 
spend about five and a half hours putting the pumpkins on. And it's a work of art, if I can say so. It's uh, made out of one inch tube steel with uh, cement rebar, uh, cut and bent into circles, uh, two different sizes for the larger pumpkins and squash and the smaller ones. And then it's uh, decorated with alternating uh, every variety that we grow, it's, it's on here. The pumpkin house is the entrance to a straw bale maze that we have here for, for younger kids to go through. And uh, so they, they're having a great kick out of, uh, out of going through the pumpkin house. If you can bring a smile to someone's face, uh, you know, for me, just watching the little kids here during the fall year, that's, that's what it's all about. It is that interesting line between art and obsession. It, it actually looks fantastic, and this is the time of year when we start thinking about what we're going to do on the 31st. For me, it's the high hopes at the beginning of the month that this is the year finally I'm going to have a really good set of decorations. Never happens. I'll be out there on the 30th trying to figure out what to do. That is The National for October the 5th. Have a good night.